Capitalism and Colonialism in Late 19th Century Europe Jack Wayne 1 Introduction 1873 marked the beginning of the Great Depression in Europe. All of the European economies were affected, albeit to differing degrees, by a fall in the prices of most categories of commodities and consequent economic distress. In Britain the fall in prices, and its effects on commerce, was watched carefully, and extensive comment was made about it. The economist, for example, wishfully held for some time that the depress ion was temporary. In late 1874 that journal was still looking forward confidently to a gradual revival of trade 1, 1874, 1186, and in early 1875 it was observed with some relief that there had been a comparatively stationary set of prices, for some time, 1875, 5, but the pause in the decline of prices turned out to be short-lived. By March of 1875 prices were observed to have dropped by 20 to 25 percent since the close of 1874, at the end of March it was recognized that there was a general want of life throughout trade. QL 875, 364, in July there were reports of great mercantile disasters which have followed so rapidly one after another. 1875, 805, finally, in August of 1875, there was recognition of a commercial crisis. 1875, 10,161 so began a trend which lasted, with some cyclical fluctuations, until 1896, in France also there was, by 1875, recognition that an economic crisis existed, the Journal des Economistes published a report by the Ministers of Commerce and of Foreign Affairs, which recognized that La France traverse en ce moment un crise difficile, a crisis also felt in Belgium, Germany, and in many of the great industries of Britain. Diocine et de cases, 1875, 127, in France the fall of prices ushered in a period of economic stagnation even more severe than that of the other industrial economies. The process of growth was retarded after 1870 and only recommenced after 1896. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 74, in Germany the fall in prices and the associated economic difficulties were labeled as the Grinder Crise, the crisis which greeted the founding of the new German state. Here too 1873 ushered in a long period of falling prices although economic recovery came more quickly than in Britain or France. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 22-3, nonetheless the crisis, which was first experienced in Berlin as bank failures, caused a considerable amount of financial panic and led to meetings of industrialists to attempt to ameliorate the situation. Clapham, 1968, 316, the Great Depression was coincident with a remarkable wave of expansion by the European states affected by it. The extension of European political jurisdiction, through the establishment of colonies and protectorates began in earnest in 1881, and continued until the end of the century. Thus after several years of falling prices, bankruptcies, and other economic difficulties, the European states came to act militarily and politically overseas. But the identification of a link between the economic difficulties and political military aggression cannot be assumed a priori. The evidence entitles us to dismiss the argument which some British historians have advanced, that there was no break in British policy after 1873, i.e., that the British state had been equally expansionist throughout the century, Gallagher and Robinson, 1953, because it is a view not applicable either to Britain or to the other European powers carrot the vast acquisition of territory can be traced on any good set of maps, and the evidence supports Lenin's view that after the 1870s the struggle for the territorial division of the world becomes extraordinarily sharp p. 1970, 75, but the coincidence of economic depression and colonial expansion does not by itself establish a causal connection between the two. Some commentators have
suggested that the impetus for the colonial seizures was not produced by the economic experiences of the period, but has an independent grounding in autonomous political events and social movements. Fieldhouse, for example, has argued that imperialism is a sociological phenomenon with roots in political facts. 1961, 209, in the European countries, while Galbraith, 1960, and Emmanuel, 1972, have argued that political problems overseas were a catalyst for the colonial seizures. In the face of this expert testimony, the connection between the economy and the political military aggression must, therefore, be established rather than assumed. The argument of this paper is that there was indeed a link between the Great Depression and colonialism, and in the following pages we shall trace that link both logically and empirically. Using the tools of Marxist economics, we shall identify the major underlying economic problem of the era, the fallen rate of profit, which haunted the British and French economies. We shall show that there were logical ways of solving this problem and we shall find, using empirical data, that these logical solutions to the economic problems were actually undertaken by capitalists within the European national states. Looking specifically at Britain and France, we shall trace the way in which recognition of the economic problems was translated into imperial adventures overseas as the fallen rate of profit transformed those political and ideological factors, sometimes considered to be autonomous. We shall find that while we cannot dismiss the non-economic factors brought forward by Fieldhouse and others to account for imperialism in this era, it will be useful to make some sense out of them by placing them firmly within the political economy of European capitalism. There we shall see that the reaction of the national state to the competitive position of its commodity output, and the military implications of capitalism, go a long way toward accounting for those e-political factors. In the late 19th century, as now, competition among national capitals could not be divorced from geopolitical rivalries among states. It will be necessary to add to our economic analysis a sense of what the implications of economic recomposition and decline were for geopolitics. We shall find that there is no basis, other than the interstate rivalry within Europe, for accounting fully for colonial expansion in the period. Our argument is that neither Britain nor France would have moved so quickly and so far on the accumulation of overseas territories were it not for this rivalry, and that it is likely that Germany would not have moved at all on this question. Our agenda in this paper will follow the logic of the argument W wish to make. After an examination of the economies of Britain and France, in order to establish the grounds of expansionism, we shall look at the German economy and show that economic factors do not account for its seizure of colonies. We shall show that Germany found it necessary to seek colonies although its major political and economic concerns lay with its national integrity in Europe. We shall conclude by drawing together the lessons we have learned about late 19th century colonialism and contrasting them with those of other students of the subject. To the rate of profit in Marxist economics the rate of profit is the motive power of capitalist production. Marx, 1971, 254, for Marx a fall in the rate of profit leads to crisis, swindling, more intense competition, centralization of capital, overproduction, depreciation of capital, and fluctuations in the price of money. With the fall in the rate of profit there is, in short, a real falling off of the reproduction of capital in all its forms, and hence a threat to capitalism. 1971, 254, Marx assumed that the rate of profit pertained to the economy as a whole, but he did suggest that it was at the level of the individual enterprise that the fall in the rate of profit would be perceived and steps taken to counteract that fall. An examination of the formula for the rate of profit leads to an understanding of the steps that might be taken to redress a fall in the rate of profit, either by the individual enterprises which Marx understood to be the source of activity on this question, or by capitalists working collectively. According to Marx the rate of profit is the ratio of surplus value to the sum of constant and variable capital. That is, where PF is the rate of profit S is surplus value C is constant capital and V is variable capital it follows from this formula that the rate of profit can be raised whenever the mass of the surplus value grows larger, with capital remaining constant, 
or whenever the value of constant and variable capital diminishes, surplus value remaining constant. In order to use this formula to understand the economic events of the late 19th century, it is necessary to expand it and break it down into its component parts. The expanded formula may be expressed, where P asterisk is the rate of profit S is surplus value C1 plus C2 plus V. Is fixed constant capital, the machines, and physical plant used in production C carat is circulating constant capital, the raw materials consumed in production, and the depreciation of C carat and V is variable capital using this formula, we can come to grips with the logical possibilities open to capital once the rate of profit falls. It should be noted, however, that Marx's discussion in Capital, Volume 3, revolved around the tendency of the rate of profit to fall with capitalist development, which is a somewhat different problematic, Marx focused on two ratios, S V, the ratio of surplus value to paid labor power, the rate of exploitation, and C carat plus C2, the ratio of the constant capital advance to the available capital. It was Marx's argument that although the rate of exploitation would rise over time, tending to increase the rate of profit, the ratio of constant to variable capital, the organic composition of capital, would also tend to rise with capitalist accumulation, acting to reduce the rate of profit. At the same time, Marx argued, capitalists would adopt corrective measures to reverse the fall in the rate of profit when it took place, by further increasing the rate of exploitation, by cheapening the value of fixed constant capital, the machines, buildings, and other elements of the physical plant, and slash or by cheapening the value of the raw materials and semi-finished goods which enter into production. The result would then be cycles consisting of a drop in the rate of profit, followed by a rise m the rate, followed by a further fall, and so on. 1971, 259, 255, 266, Marx's argument concerning the tendency of the rate of profit to fall has been challenged, Hodgson, 1974, Scoer, 1976, and in this paper we take no view on the validity of Marx's theory. Our problem is, rather, to look at the steps open to capital to redress the fall in the rate of profit once it takes place. Our treatment of the question begins with the empirical fact that the rate of profit fell after 1873. Using Marx's formula for the rate of profit we can determine that capitalists could, at that juncture, undertake steps to call into play what Marx, 1971, 232 FF, called the counteracting influences to the falling rate of profit. The formula, and Marx's discussion, orient us to three categories of steps open to capital after 1873. The first of these concerns attempts by capitalists to appropriate as surplus value a larger proportion of the value of the commodities produced. In order to do this capitalists can attempt to increase the absolute surplus value, by increasing the intensity of work or, what was less likely in the late 19th century, by increasing the length of the working day. Again, through productivity gains in the consumer goods industries, perhaps joined with an attempt to drive down the value of labor power by striking at the standard of living of the workers, they could raise the rate of relative surplus value. Secondly, capitalists could aim at cheapening the value of the fixed and circulating constant capital. Fixed constant capital can be reduced through productivity gains in the capital goods industries, and through conversion to production processes that take less constant capital relative to variable capital, that is, processes which are labor-intensive. Circulating constant capital can be reduced in value through productivity gains or through a change in the proportion of raw materials and semi-finished goods which enter into production. Thirdly, the rate of profit can be raised by taking steps outside of domestic production. One such step enumerated by Marx is to attempt to sell commodities overseas above their value, thus realizing extra profit on the sale. This is only possible, however, given an absence of competition in overseas markets, as Marx notes. 1971, 238 FF
These three categories of actions which capitalists might undertake when faced with a falling rate of profit serve to establish an agenda for our examination of the national economies of Britain and France and Germany. We shall find that in the cases of Britain and France, the fall in the rate of profit led capital to look overseas. In the British national economy the organization of the working class made it difficult to raise the rate of exploitation. The value of wage goods tended to fall, based in large part on the great increase in the quantities of foodstuffs and other commodities which became available at lower prices, from overseas producers, and was not matched by corresponding reductions in money wages. While at the same time there was an attempt to shift into labor-intensive production, the major focus of British capital lay in the supplies of raw materials. For France the solution to the problem of low profits generally lay outside of production. In the French case there was no reorganization of production as in Britain, and the cost of overseas supplies was less important to French capital. The French capitalists thus sought to secure markets for their products in overseas territories where higher prices might be obtained. The difficulty faced by both the British and the French capitalists during this period was that overseas suppliers did not willingly accept diminishing prices for their commodities, and overseas customers did not willingly pay more for European goods. The solution to the economic problem thus involved political and military intervention overseas. In the German case, no link can be established between the economy and colonial adventures, and we shall look elsewhere for our explanation of German colonialism. 3. The British economy The history of the rate of profit in the European economies can be traced only approximately, since available data are expressed in terms of prices, and data do not exist in manageable form to calculate the total price of the circulating constant capital. Nonetheless, the British data available to us strongly suggest that there was ample motivation for capitalists in Britain to turn their attention overseas, in particular to ensure the production of raw materials at favorable prices. Table 1, in the statistical appendix, helps trace developments for the industrial economy as a whole. Columns 2 and 8 of Table 1 allow us to locate the source of the mood of depression, Dobb, 1963, 303, which set in during the 1870s and 1880s in British business circles. There was a net decline in the mass of profit between 1870-74 and 1875-79, and a very small increase in the 1880-84 interval. The index of profit, calculated as the ratio of the mass of profit to the mass of fixed constant capital plus the mass of wages, also fell in the decade after 1870-74, this diminution of the mass and index of profit set in train the attempts to increase profits and profitability subsequently. The discussion of the behavior of British capitalists during these years has consumed many pages of economic history. It is generally understood that these were years of a long stagnation in profits, Saul, 1969. 42 and that for many reasons capitalists were unable to take effective steps to restore them to their pre-depression level. Much of the discussion centers around the failure of British entrepreneurs to adopt new productive techniques, however, see, example Lindert and Trace, 1971, and does not come to grips with all of the factors which enter into the determination of profit. It therefore remains inconclusive. But we can use our understanding of the elements of profitability to see what steps were open to capitalists to raise profits, in logic, and what steps they actually could take, given the prevailing circumstances of the time. Our examination follows the agenda established in our preceding section, we shall look first at exploitation, secondly at fixed and circulating constant capital, and thirdly at steps that were taken outside of production. 1 wages and exploitation. The data presented in column 6 of table 1 show that capitalists were unsuccessful in raising the rate of exploitation during the Great Depression. Greater accuracy of expression is achieved, however, by putting the case the other way around, workers were successful in winning a reduction in the rate of exploitation, through gains in real wages. The reasons for their being able to do so are complex, and they can be here but briefly sketched.
the British working class, like that of other industrial nations, was divided between the skilled artisan and craft workers on the one hand, and the semi-skilled and unskilled workers on the other. The artisanal and craft workers retained a large Amkin asterisk of discretion over the work process, and generally controlled the entry of apprentices into their fields. They therefore had an effective threat to use against capital, when these workers struck they were not easily replaced, and production would grind to a halt. The unskilled and semi-skilled workers, in contrast, lacked control over the work process and over the entry of workers into their occupations, and given the number of unemployed workers who could be induced by capital to replace them were they to strike, they did not have an effective weapon to use against capital. As a result the unskilled and semi-skilled workers turned increasingly, during the Depression, to the formation of unions that attempted to incorporate as much of the stratum of the working class as possible, in order to create solidarity with those who might take the jobs of the striking workers, and to more broadly based political action. In this way the unskilled and semi-skilled workers attempted to conduct their struggle against capital on political and economic fronts, while the skilled workers continued to assume that they had a worthwhile position in the existing system of production and often refrained from taking action that would be injurious to the industry in which they were employed. Hobsbawm, 1968, 320 to 1, struggle against capital thus was waged in different ways by the different strata of the working class. In general it was the skilled workmen who were the most successful in increasing their wages during this period, and the unskilled workers experienced continuous threats to their standard of living. Thompson, 1967, capitalists fought the skilled workers, however, by attempting to increase the scale of production, Ashworth, 1972, 90, and by mechanizing and simplifying the work task. Londis, 1969, 294 FF. Given the substantial wage differential between the skilled and unskilled, the dot conversion to mass production and the replacement of skilled craftsmen and artisans with unskilled workers provided a promising path for some British capitalists to take, albeit a path which met with a great deal of resistance from workers. The growth of real wages as shown in column 3 of table 1, during the Great Depression, thus reflects a number of trends in the history of Exploit 3 Tashin in Britain. Skilled workers were largely successful in enjoying wage gains, while the unskilled fought, sometimes successfully, against wage reductions. As prices of wage goods fell during the Depression, partly as a result of the conversion to mass production in some of the consumer goods industries, the standard of living of the skilled workers rose markedly, while the unskilled workers fought to maintain money wages at a level that would allow them gains in the level of consumption they were able to enjoy. The result was an increase in real wages per worker for the working class as a whole of over 60% between 1870 to 74 and 1890 to 94. 2. Constant capital. British capital could not, as we have seen, raise the rate of exploitation. The organization of the working class, which was rendered more effective in part by changes in British electoral politics life during this period. Wayne, 1979, closed off attempts by capitalists to do so. As a result capitalists were left with attempts to cheapen the relative value of fixed constant capital, to drive down the relative value of circulating constant capital, or to make changes outside of production. All of these attempts were indeed undertaken by British capital. Turning first to fixed constant capital, we have seen above that the rate of profit can be raised, at any given rate of exploitation, by incorporating new productive processes into the economy which are more labor-intensive, requiring more variable as opposed to constant capital. Within Britain there was from time to time during this period a shift of investment to spheres where labor was less productive, largely in the construction of social overhead, railways, schools, utilities, and housing. Hall, 1968, little is known, however, about the consequences of this highly variable trend in investment on the British economy, Saul, 1969, 36, 42 ff, and there is no basis for estimating its effects on the average rate of profit.
Our speculation is that a large-scale trend to these more labor-intensive sectors of production was inhibited by the rising cost of skilled labor power, which was likely to cut into profits, by the fact that demand for these commodities was cyclical and generated by the pace of urbanization and suburbanization in Britain, to which it was squarely linked, and by the nature of the markets in money capital which made this type of investment attractive only at intervals. Habakkuk, 1968, no great relief for capital appears to have come from this quarter. The evidence on the capitalist's success in cheapening fixed constant capital is somewhat more conclusive. For the economy as a whole there was substantial new investment in fixed constant capital in every five-year period after 1870-74. Column 4 of Table 1 shows that investment in the machines and buildings in the industrial sector grew by increments of approximately 10% to 12,5% between each interval. Column 5 allows us to evaluate the meaning of a rise of this magnitude in the total price of fixed constant capital. THN in carat XNF capital composition, which measures the ratio of fixed constant capital to variable capital, shows a continuing diminution of that ratio. That is, while fixed constant capital grew substantially it did not keep pace with the investment in variable capital, hypothetically, then, had the rate of exploitation remained constant, investment at this level would have led to a rise in the rate of profit, rather than a lowering of it. More concretely we can say that capitalists were investing more, proportionately, in having a larger labor force of better paid workers than in machines and other aspects of physical plant. Column 1 illustrates one result of this tendency, each pound of fixed constant capital invested in British industry in the 1890-94 period generated more industrial income than a pound invested in 1870-74. According to these figures it took H3.32 of fixed constant capital in 1870 to 74 to earn one pound of income, while it took only L2.95 invested in fixed constant capital in 1890 to 94 to do so. In other words, a worker in British industry at the end of the Great Depression used less fixed constant capital to generate one pound of income for his firm but that worker took a much greater share of income home as wages. If the worker's struggle to increase wages had not been successful, the rate of profit would have risen in the British economy. These observations can serve to illuminate the arguments made by economic historians about British industry during this period that British capitalists tended not to invest in the new industrial technology at the same rate as their counterparts in Germany and in the United States, but rather clung to the older methods of mining, refining, processing, and fabricating. This view can be understood to be partially correct. It is true that the rate of growth of productivity in British industry decreased markedly with the onset of the Great Depression, as Kopic, 1956, and Saul, 1969, have shown. It is also true that this was associated with a relative slackening of investment in British industry, as somewhat more of the money capital accumulated in Britain went into social overhead capital and into investment abroad. Moreover, this diminution of the rate of growth in productivity and in investment can be linked to structural problems in the British economy, British industry had grown rapidly in the 19th century on the basis of steam power and on the development of machine technology, especially in the capital goods sector of the economy. By the last quarter of the century, however, it became increasingly difficult to introduce refinements in the technology that would lead to wholesale gains in productivity, while at the same time it would have been so costly to replace the existing plants, which represented Britain's stock of fixed constant capital, with those of a new generation based on a new approach to engineering that this option appears to have been unrealizable. In terms of fixed constant capital, therefore, British industry rested with minor refinements to existing techniques. As Londis tells us, from 1870 on, with the exception of a branch like steel which was transformed by a series of fundamental advances in technique, British industry had exhausted the gains implicit in the original cluster of innovations that had constituted the Industrial Revolution. More precisely, it had exhausted the big gains. The established industries did not stand still.
but the marginal product of improvements diminished. 1969, 234 to 5, at the same time, however, British enterprises did continue to look for ways to secure a competitive advantage by cheapening the average value of the commodities they produced. One way of achieving this result was to speed up production on the basis of existing technology. In some areas, most of them consumers' goods industries such as woolen textiles, Kindleberger, 1964, 294 FF, ready to wear clothing, and shoes, Londis, 1969, 295, production increased due to the concentration of the workers in factories and the close supervision and faster pace of work that brought with it. Thus, although the technology, such as the loom or the sewing machine, had been available for some time gains in output were achieved by pushing the worker to labor with greater intensity. The attempt to increase production and cheapen the average value of the commodities produced thus rested on a new organization of production, designed first, to ease the movement of work through the plant, and second, to draw more output from each man with a given body of equipment. Londis, 1969, 302, we may add that a better paid and hence better nourished laborer was not incidental to this type of industrial revolution, but a necessary component of it, although it remains for future research to link up the legislation of this period, which facilitated worker organization and wage advances, with the reorganization of industrial production. We have discovered thus far that capitalists were unsuccessful in restoring the rate of profit by increasing the rate of exploitation, the rate of exploitation actually fell during this period. We have observed that it is likely that there were no substantial gains made by converting to labor-intensive enterprises, although the data on that point are impressionistic. In contrast, there was some success in cheapening the relative price of fixed constant capital. Because it was difficult for British industry to convert to a whole new technology based on, for example, electricity, and on some new applied engineering, given the amount of capital already tied up in the existing physical plant, it did have recourse to reorganizing production in some sectors, based on an acceleration of existing methods. Some restoration of the rate of profit was engendered in this way, as the increase in the total prices of the commodities produced outstripped the added increments of fixed constant capital. A consequence of this success in processing more materials per worker through the acceleration of production was an increasing focus on the supplies and prices of raw materials, however. It is our contention that attempts to decrease the relative costs of raw materials led the British, with increasing velocity, toward a policy of dot-colonial seizures. The history of circulating constant capital thus bears examination at some length. In the case of circulating constant capital the movement of supply and prices after 1873 directly contradicted some of the observations Marx had made about the preceding period, but this movement remains explicable in terms of Marxist economics. Marx noted that as the growth of fixed constant capital took place, the machinery employed in manufacture would become progressively greedier for larger and larger supplies of high-quality, low-cost materials, as capitalism developed machinery carried wood corns to process huge amounts of these raw materials. In this way a greater proportion of the value of the finished commodity would be comprised of the value of the raw material, the proportion of the value of the commodity that was a product of the direct application of labor and the transmission of the value of the machine having fallen. So it follows that the problem of securing ample quantities of circulating constant capital would be exacerbated with the development of capitalism while, at the same time, the price of the raw materials would increasingly be perceived to influence profit levels. Marx, 1971, Chapter 6 provides us with ample evidence in his discussion to establish the case that there was an imbalance between industrial capacity and capacity to supply the raw materials. There was a chronic if periodic, problem of the supply of these materials, and, as Marx shows, there were a number of solutions open to capitalists to solve the problem. During those periods of the 19th century in which there were rapidly rising prices of raw materials, based on spurts in demand, new sources of supply were developed in more distant areas, there were increases in production from the areas already producing, 
and greater efficiencies in the productive process to create less waste were introduced. Also during periods of rising prices collective action was sought, in which capitalists join slash asterisk ed slash hands and form slash ed j associations to regulate production. 1971, 119, the net effect of this activity was almost inevitably an oversupply and subsequent collapse in the price of these raw materials. During period of collapse marginal raw materials producers would be driven out of business. Marx paints for us a picture of violent fluctuations in the prices of these materials, and uncertain existence for all but the most favored producers. The aggregate effect of this process he generalized in terms of a perpetual imbalance in the level of development between town and country, and between agriculture and industry. The long-run tendency, as both Ricardo, 1971, and Marx had observed, was for the costs of manufactured goods to diminish relative to those of raw materials and food. In this way the increased quantities of raw materials necessary for increased industrial production would be paid for by even larger increments of manufactured goods. In modern usage, the terms of trade moved consistently against manufactured goods. This was a consequence of the labor savings in industry not being duplicated in agriculture and other raw materials producing enterprises. In the actual course of events the historic relation between the costs of raw materials and manufactured commodities reversed itself after 1873. The terms of trade of raw material relative to manufactured goods, which has been indexed by Lewis, 1952, at 101.7 in 1873, began a long downward slide in the next year, and reached the lowest point in 1895 with an index of 82.5 in 1895, a drop of 19%. This reversal of the long-run tendency for raw materials to become more expensive, relative to manufactured goods, represents an important success for British capitalism. Regrettably, data are not available that would allow us to evaluate more precisely the impact of the cheapening of circulating constant capital on the rate of profit. Nonetheless, there is both logical and historical support for the view that an adequate supply of raw materials at low prices was essential to British capitalism. Logically, as we have seen, the most progressive of British capitalists were converting to mass production, and therefore were processing more raw materials at a faster pace, we can infer that the price and supply of these materials would have become central to the profit position of these enterprises. Given that many of these enterprises manufactured wage goods, and therefore, that the price of their products set limits on the capacity of other capitalists to appropriate relative surplus value, we can easily imagine that much of British capital would be in sympathy with the quest for a favorable trade position in raw materials. The historical sources affect this growing interest in supplies of raw materials by British industry. There was in many sectors an increased consumption of raw materials. Raw cotton consumption, for example, went up from 475.8 thousand metric tons on average in the years 1865 to 74 to 747.7 thousand metric tons on average in 1895 to 1904 although the number of cotton spindles in Britain rose only slightly. Similarly, raw wool inputs in the same period rose from 145.1 thousand metric tons to 216.1 thousand metric tons, and inputs of jute from 118.9 thousand metric tons to 223.6 thousand metric tons. Mitchell, 1973, further, in other expanding consumer industries, such as soap and margarine, there was a problem of supply of the raw materials, Carlot, 1958, 63, Stuvenberg, 1969, in the late 19th century which inhibited the growth of these industries and set off a search for new sources of supply and new types of raw materials. It is in the attempt to secure larger volumes of raw materials at lower prices for British industry that we can locate the chief motivation for British overseas involvement. While it is the case that many of Britain's raw materials were generated internally, and that Britain continued to export a major raw material, coal, it is also true that by the time of the Great Depression Britain had become dependent on overseas suppliers for many such products.
Wrigley, 1978, it was fortuitous for British capital that the volume of trade in these commodities increased and prices fell during this period, but it was no accident. Rather it was in substantial part the product of active intervention by British capitalists and the British, state overseas. Relative price decline in a commodity or class of commodities can occur in the course of economic events which affect purchase and sale on the market. Increases in productivity, for example, which decrease the amount of labor time socially necessary to produce the commodity or to transport it, will be reflected in the lowering of the relative average price of that commodity. The formation of markets in commodities, which forces all producers to sell at an average price that in the long run reflects the average amount of labor involved in producing the commodity, also leads to a decline in prices as producers attempt to make commodities more cheaply and thereby gain a competitive advantage on the market. Both of these movements were found in the late 19th century, in the German coal industry, for example, gains in mining technology made it possible for producers to decrease the amount of labor time involved in producing the commodity, and hence to sell more cheaply. Henderson, 1975, similarly the new steamship technology, as it was refined during the late 19th century led to diminished transportation costs and allowed for substantial price reductions in a wide range of commodities. At the same time, these lower transportation costs facilitated the formation of world markets, which led to diminishing prices for some commodities, such as agricultural products, which had not been significantly affected by gains in productivity, although they did reflect the effects of putting new lands into production. Ordinarily, as we have seen, a diminishing price for a commodity leads to the withdrawal of some producers, those less able to reduce the costs of production, or to show a profit at existing price levels, from the market. What needs to be explained, therefore, is the maintenance of production of raw materials in the face of falling prices and worsening terms of trade. Especially in areas which did not have a national economy and in which, therefore, the producers of these commodities did not share in an average rate of profit. In West Africa, for example, the decline in prices led to reduced or stagnant exports of palm oil, palm kernels and ground nuts in the 1880s. Hopkins, 1973, 134, this break on the expansion of production, and in some cases a reduction in production, did not lead to the anticipated economic consequence, however, prices did not rise, thereby encouraging more producers to enter the market or existing producers to expand production. Rather it set in train a sequence of interventions by the British in West Africa. This sequence, which was replicated with variations elsewhere in what was to become the Third World, almost invariably ended with British political and military seizure of overseas territories, which in turn served to supply support for, and often coercion of, production. The sequence of events leading to colonial domination is the product of a complex interaction of British industrial capitalists, merchants overseas, the administrators of the existing colonial enclaves overseas, the foreign office and colonial office in Britain, and the overseas producers of the raw materials. We shall here outline the process in West Africa, an area to which historians have paid a great deal of attention, and for which there is a great deal of information. Prior to 1873, the British as well as other European nations, maintained colonial enclaves on the west coast of Africa. These enclaves provided bases for the merchants trading in West Africa, and ports of call for the ships which transported West African products. The jurisdiction of the enclaves was, however, limited, and generally did not extend into the areas in which most of the production took place and in which a great deal of the trade with African middlemen and producers was conducted. There was competition in many of these areas among merchants, both African and European, for the commodities produced, and prices remained relatively high, albeit with the periodic depressions to be expected given Marx's model, as in the 1860s. With the deflationary trend after 1873, however, competition intensified. The adverse movement in the terms of trade in the last quarter of the 19th century had a serious effect.
the trade depression intensified rivalries within the various interest groups and between African producers on the one hand, and European firms on the other. Essentially, the dispute was over the distribution of reduced profits. The decline in the barter terms of trade affected the European firms in West Africa as well as primary producers. Initially, it was these firms which received lower prices for produce in Europe, and it was up to them to try and pass on reductions to their African suppliers. Hopkins, 1973, 154, at this point merchants began to call on the administrators of the coastal enclaves to establish political control over the interior regions of production and trade, in order to give them an oligopsony and therefore the capacity to fix prices, as well as to force the Africans to continue production. In this way, above all, the principal entrepot merchants responded by trying to control deflationary trends through price-fixing cartels, but were unable to prevent ring-breaking by African middlemen, smaller import-export brokers and foreign rivals. They therefore began to call for political action up to and including colonial annexation, as a means of checking or suppressing commercial competition and, by reducing the political independence AF African middlemen, forcing them to accept lower prices, Monroe, 1976, 72-3, the challenge to British trade in West Africa came mainly from France, French capital, as we shall see below, was more wedded to craft and artisanal production than British capital. The average values of French commodities were therefore higher than comparable commodities produced in Britain, and the French merchants had a great deal of difficulty in competing in these markets. The French state, for reasons we shall explore. Below, considered it extremely important that French commodities should find their markets. As a consequence the French state was active in staking out colonies in the interior and ensuring that these colonies, and the holdings along the coast acquired in earlier times, would enjoy protective tariffs and deal, as much as possible, with French merchants. Both the French and British states throughout this period, and the German state in the years 1884-90, began to claim colonies on a preemptive basis, out of concern that valuable trade on raw materials or valuable markets might end up in rival hands. Much of the territory that passed into British hands during this period thus had little direct significance for supplies of circulating constant capital. Thus in addition to those areas which were producing this valuable contribution to the British economy, and areas which appeared to be of strategic significance to the control of the supply areas, there were territories taken simply in order to keep them out of rival hands because of their potential economic significance. It is the territories producing commodities for the British market which are of greatest interest to us. In these places the intervention was often successful in maintaining or expanding production although prices stayed low until after the turn of the century. There is no evidence of British companies and the British state using direct, armed coercion of producers as came to be the case for at least one other European nation, Harms, 1975, but a great deal of evidence that British colonialism brought with it indirect coercion in the form of taxes, alienation of land, and various forms of political pressure. Wayne, 1975, the techniques used varied among colonies, both in Africa and elsewhere, and the full employment of these coercive measures was not undertaken until after the turn of the century. Then, after a round of railway building, and with the ration. Alization of administration, output from these new colonies became increasingly tailored to British demands. Wolfe, 1974, 23, it is in this context that we may evaluate the allegations with which we began this discussion of the British economy, namely, that somehow there was a failure of British entrepreneurship during the Great Depression which rendered it incapable of restoring the rate of profit. The consequence is, of course, true, the British economy continued to suffer from a low rate of profit throughout the Depression. But the antecedent is clearly false, because it considers only productivity trends in industry rather than the full range of determinants, of the rate of profit. As we have seen, British capitalists succeeded in cheapening the relative prices of fixed and circulating constant capital, and began to switch to production processes based on the rapid conversion of raw materials into finished goods. These were, 
as we have outlined them, reasonable steps to take in an economy in which there were only marginal gains to be made from technical innovation. But there is an even greater success enjoyed by British capital, it succeeded in securing government intervention on its behalf in distant corners of the globe. During the last two decades of the 19th century both Parliament, Shannon, 1976, and agencies of the state such as the Foreign Offices, Platt, 1968, came to be increasingly active in the promotion of imperial expansion and in the defense of specific British enterprises abroad whose maintenance was understood to be important to the British economy. In this way supplies of vegetable oils at low prices continued to flow to Britain, from Africa and elsewhere, to be used in the production of soap, margarine and other consumer goods to cleanse and nourish the workers, now increasingly driven to labor of greater intensity. We may conclude that British participation in the partition of the globe marks a substantial success for British capital during the Great Depression. 3. Markets and Investment we must now consider the relative importance of steps taken by British capital outside of domestic production to increase profits, and the relationship of these steps to the seizure of color Nice, as we saw in our discussion of the rate of profit, profits can be raised if commodities are sold above their value, but that this can only be done in an absence of competition. Since the establishment of colonial rule can lead to the restriction of access to the colonial markets, and since with the fall in the rate of profit in Britain, businessmen showed increasing fondness for measures whereby competition could be restricted, such as the protected or privileged market, Dobb, 1963, 309, it is reasonable to estimate the extent to which the possibility of access to such markets animated the expansionism of Britain in the late 19th century. The evidence, on balance, suggests that the quest for the protected market was not an important motivating factor in British imperialism in the late 19th century. It is true that as British goods became less competitive in price with German and American goods some capitalists did call for the end of the free trade system and the imposition of differential tariffs both at home, Brown, 1943, and in the colonies, in order to make British-made commodities more attractive to consumers and it is true that such tariffs were adopted in the 20th century. The historical record shows, however, that during the Great Depression the evidence for pressure by industrial capitalists on the state to conquer new markets, is, distinctly thin, Wrigley, 1978, 25, further, many of the initial treaties negotiated with indigenous rulers, in West Africa at least, called for free trade for citizens of all countries throughout. The territories of the signatory chiefs, Hargreaves, 1963, 315, rather than a preference for British traders and British goods. This lack of emphasis on protected markets in the initial stages of the establishment of colonial rule, can be understood if we keep in mind that British goods, while becoming less competitive with German and American commodities, were still lower in price and thus easier to sell when compared with those of its chief trading rival in Asia and Africa, France. At the same time the British continued to maintain superiority in the organization of shipping and marketing in the areas which later came under its rule, Hopkins, 1973. 157, and it was not, apparently, necessary to have political control to dominate these markets. It is also the case that these colonies to be did not promise to offer the British industrialists a population with a great deal of purchasing power. A more serious argument is that the British attempted to raise the rate of profit through investments of capital abroad, and that colonies served as secure havens for surplus capital. This argument has been given special attention in the literature, because of the role given to the export of capital in the works of Hobson, 1965, and Lenin. It should be noted that in Lenin's discussion of 19th century imperialism much more space was given to the question of raw materials than to the export of capital, and that Lenin's statement on the question was restricted to the view that the interests pursued in exporting capital also give an impetus to the conquest of colonies. 1970, 81, Lenin did not ascribe as central a position for capital exports in his discussions of colonialism as was the case in his discussion of the imperialist rivalries leading up to the Great War. Nonetheless, 
Lenin has served as a straw man for both Marxists and non-Marxists who have convincingly demonstrated that colonial expansion was not substantially influenced by a search for safe, British-controlled areas for British investment. There are two parts to the argument that links the accumulation of capital in Britain with colonialism. The first part, which states that the lower rate of profit in Britain after 1873 stimulated British investors to invest overseas in order to increase returns on capital, cannot be denied. It is certainly true that the pattern of industrial growth we have described led to low rates of return on many categories of domestic investment, and many investors did send their money abroad where it earned more for them. By 1890 British investors had placed almost $10 billion in enterprises and securities overseas. Kuznets, 1966, 322, further, these overseas holdings paid a slight premium over domestic investments. Emmanuel, 1972, 71 ff. But the second part of the argument, that colonies were acquired in order to provide safe niches for British capital does not fit the evidence. Unlike the situation with respect to raw materials production, or even the sale of British commodities, there was very little capital investment before 1870 in the territories that were later to become colonies. Fieldhouse, 1961, 195, colonialism could not, therefore, grow out of existing economic relationships in this sphere, as we have argued that it did in the case of raw materials production. Nor did colonialism bring with it, especially in the initial stages, any great increase in investment in these newly acquired territories who, from that day until this one, have generally remained starved of capital. Most British overseas investment before the Great War continued to be held in the white dominions of Canada, Australia and New Zealand, in Latin America, the United States, and in India. Emmanuel, 1972, 54-5, very little of it was. Placed in Africa, Emmanuel, 1972, 55, or in Asia, Fieldhouse, 1961, 196, there were good reasons for this pattern of investment. These non-colonial areas were producing use values for British capitalist production in the form of raw materials. With the high level of demand for these commodities, investment in their production, and in the infrastructure for their transportation, was much more promising than colonial alternatives. At the same time, the commodities drawn from these new colonial dependencies were largely produced by small holders, whose scale of production was modest and which did not generally employ European capital, or in plantations which tended to be labor-intensive and therefore did not require a great deal of constant capital. To be sure, both mining and infrastructure development in the colonies did require capital on a larger scale, but here once again it must be conceded that the reason for investing was not the placing of surplus capital but the need for certain essentia underscore LPCIOCTS, Emmanuel, 1972, 54, we are thus drawn back to our central argument, capitalists in Britain, with the support of the British state, sought to raise the rate of profit in a number of different ways, of which the most successful was the relative cheapening of the elements of constant capital. Inhibited by workers' organizations, and perhaps by the need for a labor force with higher standards of well-being, from increasing the rate of exploitation, and unable to control markets except in the poorest regions of the globe, the cheapening of constant capital provided a promising step forward for British capitalists. Colonialism came to be understood as an undertaking very much in the national interest, because it was linked to the continuity of supply of low-cost tropical raw materials. There were also, in conjunction with the development of these raw material supplies, secondary gains to the British economy. The profits gained from shipping, insurance and the re-export trade proved to be an increasingly substantial component of the mass of profit in the British economy throughout the 19th century. Saul, 1960, there is much else that might be identified as contributing to British colonial activities during the Great Depression. The changing British state bureaucracy, the ideology of social imperialism, 
British parliamentary politics, new military technologies, new scientific and geographical movements, and many other factors were bound up with the successful attempts of the British state to expand its colonial holdings. But the evidence strongly suggests that the raw materials problem was at the heart of the matter. An examination of the British geopolitical position does add a further dimension to the analysis, however. Unlike France and Germany, Britain was relatively insulated from aggression by other European powers by the combination of its island position and its strong navy. It did have military concerns, however. As the British economy became increasingly dependent on overseas supplies of raw materials, and added the other tropical commodities to cotton and sugar as essentials, the defense of its supply lines was of continuing interest. Robinson and Gallagher, 1970, have identified the defense of the route to India as being a particular focus of state activity during these years, but it is likely that the British state was concerned with its security of supply in general. Some of these colonial seizures were thus undertaken with a view to their strategic locations on the shipping route between the growing number of locations of raw material sources and Britain. In this way we can say that there was an additional category of colonial holdings that were taken with the raw materials problem at their route, it was not, in these cases, so much that the territories themselves contained raw materials, but that they were strategic refueling or staging areas for British shipping, or were adjacent to new colonies and strategically placed with respect to their security. We can agree with Barrett Brown, 1974, 193, that the security questions identified by Robinson and Gallagher as central to British colonial policy were really economic questions at one remove. Britain had been the leading European power, both economically and militarily, for most of the 19th century. During the Great Depression the British state attempted to support the predominant position of British capital, which was subject to increasing challenges from capitalists elsewhere. The other European states were, however, also interested in support of their own national capitals. As in the British case the attempt to support capital also involved activity to strengthen the geopolitical position of the state. In France the economic and political problems were also interdependent, although the specific grounds of French colonial aggression are different from those of Britain. For the French economy the standard sources on French economic and social history in the 19th century all arrive at the conclusion that the French economy, like the British and other European industrial economies, exhibited two contrasting bases for organizing industrial production. On the one hand, there was a movement to the factory system, the concentration of production, and the recruitment of workers into unskilled, repetitive tasks in a work setting largely organized outside their control. On the other hand many workers, those with skills learned after years of apprenticeship, produced commodities in much smaller production units, and controlled much of the organization of the work task. The remarkable difference in the French case, when compared with that of Britain, was that a far larger proportion of the workers were involved in production processes of this latter type throughout the 19th century. Thus the French economy, up to the very end of the 19th century, was marked by the persistence of labor-intensive crafts and artisanal activity in many sectors of production. Levy Leboyer, 1970, 86, O'Brien and Keeter, 1978, this maintenance of small-scale production creates difficulties for analysis, in the sense that the statistical trace on the activities of these small workshops or ateliers is very weak. We cannot, therefore, establish statistically that the rate of profit fell for the French economy as a whole during the Great Depression. We can, however, establish the fact that the rate of profit fell in the larger enterprises for which there are data, and show that it is reasonable to assume that the same consequence was felt by the more modest capitalist firms. It should be pointed out that the data on the French economy are not comparable to those on the British economy, Kindleberger, 1969, 337, and that we cannot directly compare rates and indexes. We can however compare trends in the economic history of different national economies, and that is our purpose here.
Table 2 presents Levy Leboyer's indexes of the mass and rate of profit in the French economy in the 1870 to 1904 period. The index of the rate of profit is based on the ratio of the index of profits to the index of fixed constant capital, and obtains only for those enterprises whose dividends were known and for which the marker price of the fixed constant capital could be estimated. As the table shows, the index of profit in these enterprises declined drastically after 1870-74. Given that there was a very substantial rise in real wages during the same period from 632 francs per worker per year in 1865-74 to 823 francs per worker per year in 1884-95, O'Brien and Keeter, 1978, it is reasonable to argue that there was a substantial decline in the rate of profit through the last three decades of the 19th century for that portion of the capitalist economy for which we have data. For the smaller workshops the tendency toward reduced profits was very likely to have been equally intense. Real wages of skilled workers were higher than those of the unskilled, Sewell, 1974, thus increasing the relative proportion of variable capital committed by the ateliers. At the same time, data on productivity suggest that there was no acceleration of production. O'Brien and Keeter, 1978, 178, it is likely that the relative mass of profit was small, there is evidence that these enterprises suffered a problem in realizing their output, as prices for the higher quality commodities produced by the workshops did not fall as rapidly as those of the larger enterprises, Levy Leboyer, 1970, 86, and their markets remained restricted. Kindleberger, 1969, 179, although these tendencies were offset to some extent by the fact that the smaller producers did not invest in the new forms of fixed constant capital then available, the steam-powered and electrical motors, the growth in variable capital and the reduction in the mass of profit undoubtedly led to a reduction of the rate of profit for these enterprises. The steps open to capital in both sectors of the French economy to raise the rate of profit were limited. The French worker, to a greater degree than his British counterpart, was in a position to resist attempts to raise the rate of exploitation, both economically and politically. The skilled workers, here a larger proportion of the total industrial labor force, dominated the labor movement. Moss, 1976, ch1. Shorter and 1974, CH7, Dahmerd, 1972, because of the alliance, especially in the early years of the Depression, between these workers and the Republican bourgeoisie, the state intervention in labor disputes, using its arbitration machinery, worked in favor of these workers. Later, in the 1880s and 1890s these workers formed national trade associations, the syndicates, which acted effectively to maintain wages, although working class support tended to move away from bourgeois radicals in those years. Although the unskilled workers were, as in Britain, much less able to form effective labor unions, they were able to turn to socialist politics with more consequence than was the case for the British worker, because they had been enfranchised and succeeded in electing socialist deputies. In many sectors of the economy, such as coal mining in Languedoc, Laubery, 1968, and in other extractive industries, Levy Leboyer, 1970, 86, wages were maintained or increased because of successful struggles waged with the support of the socialist parties. Conversion to new industries based on accelerated production process, which in Britain reduced the skill level of the workers and therefore their bargaining position and the average wage, was much less successful in France. It was difficult to convert the production of luxury commodities of high value and high quality to the mass production of cheaper goods for three reasons. First, the workers were, as we have just seen, very well placed within the political economy of the Third Republic to resist this movement. Secondly, the market to which the products of these process were aimed, the urban proletariat, was more restricted in France, in part because of the low birth rate, and in part because of the retention on the land of a much larger proportion of the population which in turn produced much of its own consumption needs. Thirdly, 
because of the smaller relative size of the proletariat there was a much, more limited competition for jobs, and it was more difficult to employ workers at wage levels. Low enough to make such industries profitable, thus as in Britain the rate of exploitation fell, as shown in Table 3, and as in Britain capital had to look elsewhere to redress the fallen rate of profit. As far as can be judged there was less success in France than in Britain in lowering the relative price and value of fixed constant capital. Table 3 shows that the index of capital composition rose during these years. Although for the smaller workshops in which older production processes were maintained, new investment in machines, tools and physical plant was modest, Clapham, 1968, and the ratio of fixed constant capital to variable capital remained low, some of the salutary effect of this conservative approach was diminished by the fact that a portion of the fixed constant capital was itself manufactured using costly, labor-intensive methods, so that it remained relatively expensive when compared with prices in other industrial economies. O'Brien and Keeter, 1978, for the larger enterprises the rate of growth of fixed constant capital was substantial. Levy Leboyer has indexed the total real market price of fixed constant capital in the French economy at 60,2 for 1,870 to 74, rising to 104,4 in 1895 99, as we have shown in Table 2. We saw in the British case that while rates of investment were substantial, industrial income grew at a faster rate, and that it was the lower rate of exploitation that led to a lower rate of profit. In the French case the total price of the annual industrial output also grew at a substantial rate during the same period, Lewis, 1978, 269, Grauset, 1970, but because the data are lacking to make a direct calculation we can only offer the judgment, supported by column 3 of table 3, that capitalists, in large-scale industry did not accomplish any substantial relative cheapening of fixed constant capital, and that French capital was forced to look elsewhere to restore the rate of profit. Turning to the question of circulating constant capital, it is clear that the national economy of France stood in a different relationship to its supply and price of raw materials than that of Britain, and there was much less motivation for French capital to secure political and military control over sources of supply. The structure of the French economy throughout the 19th century tended, as we have seen, to emphasize the production of commodities with a high proportion of labor time, and relatively smaller proportions of fixed and circulating constant capital, making up the final value of the commodity. With a small working class market, and a continuing emphasis on the production of commodities with high unit prices, French capital had less at stake in driving down the costs of the primary commodities, because they entered less into the determination of the rate of profit. Observations of French political economy in the 19th century reinforce this deductive conclusion. In France the agricultural workers and small holders formed a majority of the total labor force throughout the Great Depression, 64% of labor force in 1875-84, and 61% in 1885-94 were so employed. The comparable figures for Britain are 23% and 20% for those decades. O'Brien and Keeter, 1978, 94, this distribution of social labor not only influenced the structure of industrial production, but it also led to an emphasis on tariff protection for the commodities produced by this large section of the French population. The French state undertook to ensure that many of these producers, when faced with competition from foreign commodities, would be able to sell their output at prices that would enable the family holding, or the agricultural enterprise, to survive. This policy affected both foodstuffs and other agricultural products. High duties were imposed on sugar, cattle, rye, barley, oats, wheat, wine, eggs, butter, and dried fruit, along with flax, silk, hemp, and timber in the 1880s. This policy led to a somewhat less drastic decline of prices in the French economy for these commodities than was the case for unprotected national markets, Clapham, 1968, 182, but it also meant that imports of many tropical commodities were more restricted than they might otherwise have been. Examples abound, 
of course, of commodities which French merchants did import from existing and future colonies, such as Algerian wine, West African peanuts, and tropical rubber. But the French state, through its tariff policy, attempted to save a larger share of the market for fibers, oils, and fats produced by indigenous agriculturalists, and to reduce the dependency of industry on overseas sources of these commodities. The protectionist policy fit well with the strategy of the French state which, for military purposes, aimed at self-sufficiency in raw materials, following the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, which was very costly for France in terms of the loss of territory and the heavy indemnities which had to be paid after its defeat, the French state acted to develop national supplies of raw materials of all sorts. In a great many cases, and in particular in iron and coal, the economic policy of the French state led to the incorporation into manufactures of higher cost, locally extracted materials even when it was possible to import these commodities at lower cost. Kindleberger, 1969, 17FF, Mulward and Saul, 1977, 86FF. This policy worked. France's trade deficit in raw materials was reduced during the course of the Great Depression. Lewis, 1978, 45, but it did make French manufacturers higher in price than those of its chief competitors in world markets, Britain and Germany, and led to a leveling off of the size of the market for its products. Unlike Britain, France did not greatly expand its role as a trading nation during the Depression. And unlike Britain, France did not move to the development of industries which drew on overseas raw materials to create cheap wage goods. Clapham, 1968, 183, the recomposition of the French economy took place later, it began at the end of the Great Depression and was predicated on the extension of electrical power and the growth of new automobile, rubber and other industries. During the 1873-96 period French capitalism maintained a rigid structure of production, Kindleberger, 1969, 283, in which it continued to specialize in commodities for which its domestic markets were small and whose relative cost made overseas sales increasingly difficult. Lewis, 1978, 46 the activities of French adventurers, merchants, and state officials overseas, were undertaken, therefore, because it was for markets that French capitalism had a primary need. Both modern French analysis and the analysis made at the time by government officials in France identify worldwide overproduction and underconsumption as the major factor causing difficulty for French capital in the late 19th century. On est d'un conduit accepter le déclin du profit comme un fait caractéristique de dernières années du 196 siècle, Levy Leboyer writes, et en cher cher one explication so it dans un ventilation nouvelle du surplus de productivite global, 1970, 96, this analysis echoes that made by Jules Ferry, the sometime French Prime Minister, in 1885. Ferry argued that French products were being excluded from foreign markets, and that the national economy was thereby threatened. He, along with other parliamentary figures, urged a systematic plan to develop new markets for French carrot produced commodities. Inevitably, given the relative cost of the French goods, this meant the securing of protected colonial markets. Ganiage, 196.8. Ferry observed that the Indian Market had made Lancashire, and suggested by analogy that colonial markets would create consumers for French textiles as well. Whatever the weakness of underconsumptionist theories generally, almost a century of French analysis has pointed to the stagnation of France's markets as a major determinant of its fallen rate of profit in the Great Depression. We have seen that the growing uncompetitiveness of French commodities was a product of the structure of French capitalism and related to the distribution of social labor. But this ultimate cause does not vitiate our argument. In the absence of a transformation of the French economy, French capital was left with the sole option of selling its customary commodities to new consumers. Returning to the West African case, it is clear that the position of the French merchants there was very different from that of the British, French traders, and the industrialists who supplied them, found that they could not compete against the British, 
given the cost of their commodities. The British supported principles of colonial free trade or equal tariffs for commodities irrespective of national origin, but the French found that this policy led to insolvency for their merchants in Africa. The shift to a more protectionist policy was mainly a result of pressure from French metallurgical, textile, and chemical industries, which had difficulty in competing with British products in world markets. Hopkins, 1973, 160, and with the protectionist policy came the hunger for consumers to protect, as these interest groups within France sought to have the French state extend its colonial holdings. It is difficult to estimate the extent to which the seizure of colonies, and the protected markets which came with the seizure, contributed to the profitability of French capitalism. It is true that the general pattern of protection and exclusiveness in French colonial trade, preserved a soft market for the less enterprising French industries, especially in the clothing and textile trades. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 123, and it is true that French colonial railway construction, while it did not take place on the scale envisaged by the ideologists of empire in the Third Republic, did buy steel which was higher in price than the German and British products. But in general, as we discussed in the British case, the consumption levels of colonial subjects were low, and the colonial market was restricted in the range of commodities it could absorb. It is likely that the colonial expansion was, ultimately, of great value to a few capitalists such as the producers of cotton textiles, and of very little import to the majority of French capitalists, who remained indifferent to the whole issue or opposed colonialism on the grounds that it led to intolerably large government expenditures during this period. Andrew and Kenya Forstner, 1971, in contrast to Britain, then, where the supply of raw materials to new industries producing consumer goods affected every capitalist enterprise because of the impact of the workers' costs of consumption on the rate of surplus value, the French colonial expansion, which was designed to secure customers for particular capitalists only, was of much less immediate importance. The implications of this fact will be explored below. Turning to the question of the relationship between the export of capital and French colonialism, we may easily establish that French capital and the French flag marched in different directions during the Great Depression French investors, whose savings were placed overseas by the banks, tended to be members of the petty bourgeoisie, bureaucrats, and functionaries. This category of investor was most interested in advancing money under government guarantee, and with few exceptions the banks placed. These funds in countries with an established state structure whose guarantees were credible. The country which proved most attractive to French investment was Russia, the territories which came under French colonial domination during this period did not attract a great deal of French investment. Given la timi died de capitalists français, Brunswick, 1970, 410, foreign investment did not coincide closely with this control over huge areas of the world. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 122, it was also the case that French virgin investment did not increase rapidly during the Great Depression, Emmanuel, 1972, Mulward and Saul, 1977, and although Paris remained the major market on the continent for money capital it would be difficult to argue that these foreign earnings had a substantial impact on the rate of profit. We may speculate that without a great need for overseas raw materials in the national economy, it made less sense to French capital to invest in infrastructure and in the agricultural and extractive enterprises being planned for the new colonies, and that this factor, more than the personal characteristics of the investors, made colonial investment less plausible for them. The evidence, then, does not support the proposition that French colonialism was undertaken in support of French overseas investment. We are thus drawn back to the question of markets, and to discuss, Finally, the geopolitical implications of the French search for them. France's policy during this period, its railway building, attempts at economic self-sufficiency, as well as its attempts to forge alliances with other nations, reflect the fact that France's major geopolitical problems lay in Europe, deprived of a large chunk of territory in the Franco-Carid Prussian War, 1870-1871. <laughs>
faced with growing German economic and military strength, its raw materials lay on its borders, the French were greatly concerned with European security. Any attempt to explain the struggle over colonies between France and Britain must, therefore, find the connection between the French quest for markets and its position as a continental power. The explanation is made somewhat more difficult by the fact that French capitalism in general was not in favor of an expansionist policy because, as we have discussed, these markets were of importance to particular capitalists only. It is not immediately clear why the state would act against the perceived economic interests of the majority of capitalists. The link between the colonial markets and the geopolitical problems was forged by the French worker. France had invented the citizen's army. Von Clausewitz, 1968, 384 FF. The French worker was also a soldier, and the strength of the army rested in large measure on the state of its working class, and the degree to which this class, along with the peasantry, could be mobilized in time of war. This mobilization depended, as French politicians understood, not only on railways and arms, but also on the ability of the state to command allegiance. This ability was weakened by events of the early 1870s, most notably the crushing of the Commune. French policy after the defeat by Prussia rested on universal conscription, on the one hand, which would give the army a chance to instill discipline and a moral sense in each male citizen, and an attempt to create social harmony on the other. Ralston, 1967, the French state continued to crush any revolutionary stirrings, while adopting policies that would integrate the working class, as citizens, into the nation. It was this question of social harmony which Jules Ferry, the French Prime Minister in 1880 and 1885, addressed in his statements about colonialism when explaining government policy. New markets are essential, Ferry argued, because an industry which cannot sell its products is threatened by unemployment, strikes, and social problems. Ganiage, 1968, we may complete Ferry's reasoning. Given that contented workers, those who could be mobilized to fight for their country, were a byproduct of a healthy industry which enjoyed a high rate of profit, and this industry depended on new markets, and these new markets could only be won by conquest, the French continental military strength depended on colonial conquests. This reasoning is, of course, seriously flawed and was betrayed by subsequent history. Industry with a high rate of profit did not lead to social harmony or an improved standard of well-being for the workers, indeed, the evidence is that the rate of profit in French industry rose after the depression only with gains in the rate of exploitation. Lewis, 1978, and, in any case, we have seen that the protected colonial markets contributed little to the profitability of French capital in general. Nonetheless French colonial policy only becomes intelligible when it is recognized that the French state acted in advance of French capitalism, in order to secure economic gains for military reasons connected with its position in Europe. This contrasts with the British case in which the state acted as a consequence of capitalist activity, and in which the main geopolitical concerns lay overseas, in its defense of its sources and lines of supply. Britain and France may be understood to have scrambled for the same territory, but for different reasons. 5. The German Economy Table 4 summarizes the experience of the German economy for the years 1870-1904. The data are for German industry and handicrafts. The figures for the mass and index of profit parallel those for Britain, they show a decline in the absolute mass of profit, when measured in constant marks, in the 1875 to 79 period, followed by a recovery in subsequent quinquennia in which the mass of profit exceeded pre-depression levels, but in which the index of profit remained lower than the pre-depression figure. As in Britain the only substantial positive change in the index of profit was in the 1885 to 89 period, although the index did not subsequently fall. Once again, we may conclude the data provide ample grounds for assuming that capitalists would take steps to restore the rate of profit with the onset of the Great Depression. The data also show, however, 
that the German capitalists took different steps to restore profit rates than their counterparts in France or Britain. The index of exploitation, given in column 6 of table 4, shows that German capitalists were more successful than their counterparts in Britain and France in restricting rises in the proportion of industrial income that was paid as variable capital. In Britain and France the rate of exploitation fell throughout the depression, in Germany there was a fall in the rate in the first quinquennium, a leveling off, then a steady rise in it. Moreover, compared with France and Britain, Germany had had a low-wage economy before the onset of the Great Depression, the fact that the rate of exploitation did not continue to fall meant that the German workers were paid less, both in terms of money wages and in terms of real wages, than those of Britain and France throughout this period, Mulward and Saul, 1977, 65, German capital alone thus achieved some success in its attempts to redress the fall of the rate of profit by increasing the rate of exploitation. In the German case the intervention of the state was decisive in reversing the trend to lower rates of exploitation that characteristic of the other industrial economies at this time, and which obtained in Germany in the 1875-79 period. In contrast to the British state, which legalized various tactics of labor unions during the 1870s, and the French state, which liberalized its labor legislation in 1884, the German state mounted an attack on workers' organizations. The anti-socialist law of 1878 struck at labor unions and political parties alike. Outside of the religious-based workers' organizations the only growth of organized workers' activities occurred in the associations of craftsmen, which were restricted to the immediate locality. In general strikes for higher wages were met with repression. Lidk, 1966, 181, 245, once again, it was the unskilled and semi-skilled workers who suffered the most, attempts by the Social Democratic Party, itself outlawed under the 1878 legislation, to organize them were generally unsuccessful. Big business extensively blacklisted social democratic workers and refused to deal with established unions 1 asterisk, Roth, 1963, 258, with these formidable obstacles to organization the German worker remained poorly paid, and this, from the standpoint of capital, gave German enterprise a permanent advantage in the whole period. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 65, the repression of the unskilled and semi-skilled workers was especially beneficial for German capital because this was a time in which there was a great deal of investment in new industries which operated at a large scale, each employing hundreds of such workers. There was spectacular growth in iron and steel production, in chemicals, in electrical industries, in metalworking, and in other areas of capital goods production. Londis, 1972, compared with Britain, in which the consumers' goods industries grew on the basis of greater investment in a larger labor force of better paid workers, the German economy expanded on the basis of massive investment M fixed constant capital in capital goods production, with wages remaining relatively low. As column 4 of table 4 shows, each five-year period brought very large increments of investment in fixed constant capital. Growth of fixed constant capital outstripped the growth of variable capital, as shown in column 5, and in each period much greater capital was invested to earn each mark of industrial income than in the period before, as shown in column 8. We may conclude that the German attack on the fallen rate of profit conformed more closely to Marx's initial observations on the subject, attempts to fight the fall by increasing profits on individual capitals through investment in fixed constant capital led to a continuing low rate of profit for the economy as a whole. This recomposition of German capital did not lead the German state to undertake a campaign of colonial seizures. Most of the raw materials needed by German industry either lay within its national boundaries, or were available from nearby European countries. Germany had substantial supplies of coal, potash, iron, and most of the minerals necessary to feed its chemical industry, although it did import coal tar from Britain. The size of Germany's raw material resources and their appropriateness for late 19th century industry, Mulward and Saul have observed, 
did permit the growth of output in certain areas such as coal, steel, and chemicals to very high levels without raising acute trading problems. 1977, 41, the main growth in the German economy, then, occurred in industries which did not depend on supplies of tropical raw materials. While this industrial strategy did not immediately raise the rate of profit to pre-depression levels, massive investment in fixed constant capital which was used to process raw materials produced internally or in nearby countries, combined with a low rate of wages, did make it possible for Germany capitalists to sell their commodities at relatively low prices. All would-be competitors, especially France and Britain, had to try to meet German prices. Lewis, 1978, 111, the success of German capital in marketing its output was enhanced by policies adopted by the German state after some intense lobbying by capitalists in the 1870s, starting in 1880, the German government imposed tariffs on manufactured commodities at a level that would make the national market secure for German goods. Given the growth of price-fixing combines, the cartels, which served to keep domestic prices high, the tariffs were fixed at a level which generated substantial revenue for the state, and led to large profits for the enterprises which were protected by them. The tariffs and profits enabled the state and capital to subsidize the sale of commodities abroad. The state developed a system of export bounties to encourage exports, and the capitalists found it not worthwhile to sell abroad at cost prices the portion of their output not consumed domestically. The two-price system became institutionalized in the last half of the Great Depression, and Germany was able to do an increasing export trade with the aid of these special export prices. Clapham, 1968, 319, neither raw materials nor markets, then, were likely to lead German capitalists into overseas adventures. Although arguments were made in Germany urging a policy of colonial acquisitions to secure raw materials and markets, it is doubtful that such a colonial project should have been seriously entertained for such a purpose. Veblen, 1966, 202, it is even more doubtful that colonial seizures could have been promoted as a way of securing a safe haven for the export of German capital. Germany had, compared with France and Britain, relatively modest foreign investments. Emmanuel, 1972, 50, and the bulk of these investments were in industries and raw materials in other European national economies. Investment in industries tended to be in those areas, such as dye stuffs, in which German firms were world leaders, and were mainly involved in setting up branch plants to counteract the tariff structures of other nations, or to make surplus profits from the introduction of new technical processes, Mulward and Saul, 1977, 62-3, investments in raw materials were in the production of commodities with a utility for German manufacture, German nationals did have some investments in the territories that were being seized, but these investments were only a fraction of the total, and the fate of these holdings appears not to have been of great concern in Germany, at least in the early years of the Depression, Henderson, 1962, 4, nonetheless, between the years 1884 and 1890, a German colonial empire was established. As might be expected, given our discussion, this empire was of little economic worth to German capitalism, and a drain on the finances of the state. Very few of the raw materials useful for German industry, given the German pattern of industrialization, were available in the colonies. And, of course, colonial consumers did not provide a buoyant market for German commodities, which had most utility for economies that were themselves industrializing. Mulward and Saul, 1977, 61, thus, neither as reservoirs of raw materials nor as markets for manufactured articles did the colonies play any significant part in Germany's economic life. Henderson, 1962, 40, further, German capitalists did not find the colonies to be promising fields for investment, 1962, 59, indeed, a great deal of the investment in German colonies, and trade with them, was in British hands, 1962, chv, 
because it was the British economy that depended most on the commodities produced in the tropics. Low levels of investment led to very sluggish colonial economic growth which in turn made it difficult for the colonies to generate enough revenue to cover the costs of administration, and the German state in the period 1884-1906 spent the equivalent of £32 million more than it collected. 1962, 33, unlike Britain, then, for whom the colonies had direct economic utility as suppliers of raw materials, and unlike France, whose statesmen and capitalists looked to the colonies to provide the markets for uncompetitive French commodities, no case can be made for an economic basis for German colonialism. Hans Ulrich Weller, 1970, has attempted to argue that the German political elite in the 1880s believed that colonial seizures would stimulate the German economy, and therefore embarked on a policy of colonial acquisitions. Weller's main point is that the elite felt that an expanding economy would help dampen the social tensions which arose in the course of rapid German industrialization. Weller's argument, however, rests entirely at the level of idealism. His analysis is innocent of attempts to demonstrate a structural link between the economy and the seizure of tropical territories. If the German elite really did believe that the problems of rapid economic expansion, which were chiefly problems of class conflict and factional disputes, could be solved by further economic expansion, it is unlikely that they would have chosen the colonial policy to achieve this end. Not only did colonies have little to contribute to the German economy, but also the attempts to institute a colonial policy led to further dissension and conflict. Ely, 1976, it is true that some leaders and pro-colonialist capitalists used the economic argument to just ejx the colonial policy. But it is likely that the roots of the German territorial grab for several scattered colonies over the six-year period lie elsewhere. Weller's analysis does have the virtue of recognizing that German imperialism in the late 19th century, like that of France, was generated by the state in a situation in which the majority of capitalists had no direct interest in colonial trade. And Weller does recognize that the state acted in order to ensure the stability of the social and economic system as it stood. 1970, 124, but it is more reasonable to argue that the colonial policy was adopted because of the position Germany was in, both geopolitically and politically, at that time. Like France, Germany's main geopolitical problems lay in Europe. Much of its economic growth was taking place in peripheral regions, and was integrated with enterprises on the other side of the national boundary. The pressing questions of geopolitics thus involved the security of the border areas, which contained ethnic minorities from the adjacent countries, and the continuity of exchange with the neighboring areas in other nations, German policy thus placed great emphasis on military strength, and on alliances with other European powers. Unlike France, however, it did not attempt to integrate its citizen soldiers by intervening on their behalf in wage disputes. On the contrary, it intervened on behalf of capital. German integration was attempted through welfare legislation, at that time the most progressive in Europe. German colonial policy cannot be grounded in the same concerns, then as that of France. The roots of the German colonial policy can be found, at least in part, by fitting it into the structure of contemporary European politics, in a somewhat different way, Taylor, 1970, 6, that is, Germany's colonial policy served to demonstrate strength, on the one hand, and to FAC initiate its making alliances, or forestalling alliances among the other powers, on the other. At one level, then, Germany used the struggle over colonial possessions, which developed in the middle 1880s, to assert its status as the leading continental military power, as Sontag's, 1969, data show. On another level it used the bargaining over colonies in the context of attempts to forge alliances and to forestall them among other powers. Taylor, 1970, the economic dimension to Germany's colonial policy was a negative one, in the sense that its seizure of colonies would deprive other nations of them, and thereby weaken the economies of its rivals who were actually dependent on the raw materials and markets in the tropics.
A further source of the pro-colonial German policy may be found in the internal political situation in Germany. Prince Bismarck, the German federal chancellor, depended on support in the Reichstag for passage of legislation. It was possible to govern without majority backing, but given various problems of legitimacy in the newly unified German state Bismarck attempted at all times to have a majority behind his policies. The results of the election of 1881 had weakened his ability to mobilize the majority in the Reichstag that he needed, his traditional supporters, the Free Conservatives and Conservatives, had lost seats, and Bismarck was now dependent on the National Liberals for support. In order to gain this support Bismarck advanced a policy of overseas expansion that would appeal in particular to representatives from the upper bourgeoisie of the maritime cities, Ake, 1968, 275, as well as to representatives of the pressure groups that had been lobbying for such a policy, Bismarck was successful in securing a majority in this way. It was by pursuing a positive colonial policy that Bismarck was able to reconstruct a right-wing alliance in the Reichstag. Von Strandmann, 1969, 143, the colonial issue was also used in the election of 1884, as the government sought to overcome the growing preference of the voters for the more progressive parties, it labeled these parties, which were opposed to imperialism at that time, as unpatriotic. After 1890 the colonial debates faded in Germany, as other issues, chiefly the question of expansion in Europe, became relevant for the demonstration of might and were used for internal political manipulation. Our conclusion is that Germany seized colonies because the dispute over colonies was the issue of the moment in European rivalries in the mid and late 1880 s, and provided a vehicle for its leaders to achieve their aims of ensuring the integrity of the new state, albeit indirectly. Thus Germany did not begin its colonial expansion until the other powers had their seizures well underway. It took colonies that, in most cases, had as their only attraction the fact that they were available, Henderson, 1962, 6, and that were largely valueless in economic terms. These territories made no sense as strategic holdings for a global territorial struggle, for they were widely scattered and indefensible against a concerted attack on them by one or more other powers, as events in the Great War demonstrated. The link between the Great Depression and German colonialism hence was a mediated one, the Depression led Britain and France to take colonies, and made the colonial arena the chief locus of geopolitical rivalry, which in turn led Germany to act in this arena. 6 Conclusions Britain had the leading capitalist, industrial economy in Europe in 1873. Faced with a fall in the rate of profit that continued for over a decade, British capitalists undertook to make a number of changes in that economy. The effect of these changes was to create a shift, largely in the consumer's goods industries, to faster production using larger quantities of raw materials. Affected at the same time by a depression in prices, British capital sought to buy these growing quantities of raw materials at less cost. It proved difficult to do so in regions in which there was mercantilist competition. The reaction of producers to the fall in prices was to deal with competing mercantile networks, indigenous or European, or to withdraw from production altogether. Attempts to continue the trade in tropical commodities on terms favorable to British capital led increasingly to demands for the British state to take political control of these regions of production. This seizure of territory became widespread in the 1880s and 1890s. France had been, for many years, the second leading industrial nation in Europe, faced with a fall in the rate of profit in 1873, French capitalists also looked for ways of alleviating their distress. Unable for many reasons to abandon the structure of production established in French industry and handicrafts in the preceding hundred years, some French capitalists looked to the state to secure for it protected colonial markets in which the sales of its higher-priced commodities might be guaranteed. The commodities that might be sold in these markets were limited in type, and therefore not of interest to capital in general in France. But the state, mindful of the effects the sluggish economy would have on its position as a military nation in Europe, nonetheless acted in advance of capital to establish colonies.
wrongly supposing that the French economy would benefit greatly from these overseas territories, the state acted to pave the way for an increased penetration of French goods into Africa and Asia, with Britain, France and lesser European nations such as Belgium, and Portugal competing for territory, the scramble for Africa and parts of Asia become the new arena in which national states might demonstrate power. It was on this basis that Germany joined the scramble, although the colonies could not be assumed to be of economic utility to that country. We can now add that it was on that basis that France and Britain took additional territories, those that were unlikely to suit their economic or strategic purposes, this account may be contrasted with that of two other contemporary Marxist students of the origins of colonialism in the late 19th century, Michael Barrett Brown and Giovanni Arrighi. Barrett Brown, 1974, has argued that neither capitalism nor the tendency of capitalist countries to accumulate colonies changed after 1873, Britain, the leading industrial nation for most of the 19th century, had always had an empire. When other nations, such as France and Germany, began to industrialize more fully, they too began to assemble colonies, Barrett Brown concludes that capitalism in Britain had never been anything else than imperialist, and newly emerging capitalist nations were bound to follow suit, 1974, 186, there was more pressure for Britain to assume formal jurisdiction once this geopolitical rivalry became established, but basically the link between capitalism and imperialism is an enduring one, in this view. Arrighi S., 1978, argument also assumes a continuity in capitalist development, but focuses more fully on the interaction between the fading power, the once predominant England, and the nations now industrializing rapidly. Arrighi has argued, following Gallagher and Robinson, 1953, that as long as England was the predominant capitalist power it could rely on free trade and informal empire overseas, that is, control without the institution of formal political rule, to maintain its position. Once free trade led to industrialization elsewhere through the export of money capital and commodities, other nations began to industrialize, Britain attempted to subsidize free trade through its receipts on investments overseas and, when these investments began to wind down, by collecting tribute from its overseas possessions. At the same time, however, the other major powers were also beginning to accumulate overseas territories. Thus there was a convergence of English expansionist policy, with that of other rising powers, leading towards a new situation of anarchy and universal war. 1978, 74, the strength of these arguments, like that of Lenin earlier in the century, lies in their understanding that colonialism was a cross-product of capitalist development and the related geopolitical rivalry within the system of national states as it existed at the end of the 19th century. Unlike Lenin, however, neither is willing to concede that capitalism was entering a new era of development in the late 19th century. The continuities in capitalism are overstated. While it was the case that monopoly capitalism did not become institutionalized until after the turn of the century, it is also true that each of the major European powers faced an economic crisis during the Great Depression. Our argument in this paper has been based on the assumption that an understanding of the nature of the crisis and the steps undertaken to solve it is necessary for comprehending the underlying economic reasons for the colonial seizures undertaken by France and Britain. That examination showed the indeterminacy of the link between capitalism and colonialism. From the evidence we have brought forward it can be seen that capitalist industrialization, when occurs in the context of a large market and when the necessary raw materials are found within the national boundaries, as in Germany, need not lead to colonialism. At the same time, stagnation of industrial development may, as in the case of France, lead to strong economic impulses toward colonialism. There cannot be found a uniformity of capitalist development in the late 19th century that both Barrett Brown and Arrighi assume, or an invariable relationship between capitalism and imperialism, as Barrett Brown tries to argue. It has become conventional to take British capitalism as a standard model, and to argue from the British case to other national manifestations of colonialism and imperialism.
The consequence of this approach has been to leave the structural origins of the colonialist policy of the other European nations unexamined, except for case studies which give ultimate causal priority to political factors. Once we consider national states and economies within a context of a system of mutually interacting states and economies, a great deal of additional richness can be incorporated into the account. British colonialism was stimulated by the imperative faced by British capital to sell commodities, the only way of maintaining and expanding markets was to cheapen their value, and that in turn, given the circumstances of the era, was achieved by speeding up production and using larger quantities of materials. British commodities were able to maintain their markets in Africa and Asia on this basis, and set up competition that French capital had difficulty meeting. The French state, troubled by its weak geopolitical position in Europe, and faced with a difficulty in mobilizing its citizen soldiers in a time of economic depression and with the experience of the suppression of the commune in its recent past, acted to secure wage gains for those workers at home while it sought protected markets in France and overseas for the products of French capitalism. Meanwhile Germany, the victor in the war with France in 1870, was less concerned about its soldiers. It did institute welfare legislation, but generally repressed the working class and sought to inhibit wage rises. German commodities also found their markets, but in Europe and Latin America. The competitive position of German capitalism did not, however, inhibit the German state from making a display of strength at the conference table when colonial boundaries were drawn, partly to preempt other national states from seizing colonies that might be useful to capitalism within their jurisdictions. By means, of the commodity competition. Among capitals is established. This competition, in the late 19th century system of national states, conditioned the policies and actions of those states, which in turn affected the competitive position of the commodity, which in turn redounded upon the capacity of those states to secure the backing of their subjects, to wage war, and to maintain the integrity of the national boundaries. Late 19th century colonialism cannot be understood apart from late 19th century capitalism.